Thank you, Donna. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, I'd like to start off by talking about our voluntary uh, structural acquisition programs within the state of Iowa. As you remember from Mary's presentation this morning, uh, our flooding happened in June of 2008 and was um, felt statewide. We had 85 out of 99 counties that were federally declared disaster counties. Um, we realized quickly there was a large need for, for a housing buyout program. We do have two different programs that were offered by the state of Iowa as a result of this flooding. Um, first, to give you an idea of the timeline, the disaster happened in June of 2008, and FEMA came in and did their, their first round of hazard mitigation grant program buyouts in August of 2009. Uh, we were approached to use our 25% uh, our match from CDBG that we were provided through HUD. Um, at the time of the contracts initially, um, the state was actually paying 10% out of state funds and the 15% was covered through the local share. Uh, we were able to provide the 25% match by CDBG and we saved the state of Iowa around $8 million. Uh, the intent of the program, as you may be familiar, is to remove homeowners from the 100-year um, the floodplain and to relocate them outside of the threat of flooding. For the FEMA program, the 100-year floodplain properties were deed restricted to green space in perpetuity. Uh, CDBG allocated $20 million across 33 cities and counties statewide. The majority of what I'll talk about today is the uh, funding we provided for the 100% CDBG buyout program. Again, for a timeline, the FEMA match buyout happened in August of 2009, and this uh, program started in November of 2009, so about 16 months after the disaster happened. Uh, we were able to provide 100% funding for acquisition, clearance and demolition, relocation, general admin, and project management. We allocated $230 million across 24 cities and counties statewide. Uh, this program was mirrored very closely after the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. However, we realized that uh, we had a large need for properties located in the 500-year floodplain to be bought out as well. To give you an idea of how the application process went, um, as a state, we did administer this program in-house. Um, each of the local cities and counties in these uh, disaster declared counties were able to apply directly to the state for assistance. Uh, they gathered uh, the information for potentially eligible applicants and um, submitted that directly to the state for a contract and award. Um, in order to participate in the CDBG buyout program, each property must qualify individually in at least one of three ways. Um, most properties, or a lot of the properties that participated, were located in the 100-year floodplain. If they were located outside of the 100-year floodplain, they must be considered substantially damaged or a health and safety risk. And for our purposes, the substantial damage was uh, more than 50% of the fair market value of the structure. Eligible property types to participate, um, we had quite a few different properties uh, and different property types that wanted to be bought out as the disaster was um, spread across the state. Um, the majority of the buyout is single and multifamily residences. Have, we also do have vacant lots, commercial properties, industrial properties, and certain types of nonprofit organizations as well. Through our program, we're able to offer homeowners um, an acquisition award as well as, um, if they're eligible, a replacement housing award. The acquisition award determination, we use the 2008 pre-flood fair market value of the land and dwelling as a basis for all of the buyout awards. However, this can change um, depending upon the date that you own your home and any duplication of benefits that you may have received. We'll go through a couple examples really quickly just to illustrate how this process worked for us. Um, if you owned your home at the time of the flood, you were given, again, the 08 pre-flood fair market value of the land and dwelling. We did allow homeowners and property owners to participate if they purchased their home or property after the buyout. However, there were restrictions for their award amount. And for an example, if a um, pre-flood property was worth $200,000, um, someone came in and purchased the home, say, a year after the flood for $300,000, we capped their award at $200,000. Uh, we made this decision so that um, property owners could not come in and speculate on buyout homes that had been damaged, and we uh, really wanted to decrease um, any potential for fraud in this area. 
As we all know from yesterday, uh, the duplication of benefits as required under the Stafford Act is uh, mandatory for all federal assistance. And for the buyout program, uh, we checked a number of different funding sources that they could receive for a uh, repair or for a structural award. Um, some common DOBs we found were um, public and private insurance awards for structure, uh, FEMA for repair, and we also had quite a few state programs that we offered for uh, repair assistance and for interim mortgage assistance. Again, the uh, duplicative funding decreased their buyout award, and we'll look at a quick example of that. Here's a very common case in the state of Iowa that happened. Um, the pre-fed fair market value of the land was $50,000. For the dwelling, it was one fifty. dollars So this person's maximum amount, award amount, was $200,000. Um, they did have some DOBs they received, and this was very common. Uh, FEMA for repair of about $15,000. And an insurance payment, it could be a, a sewer backup, um, something for structure of around $5,000. Total DOB was set at $20,000 for this person, and their acquisition award was $180,000. Um, in addition to acquisition, as I mentioned earlier, we're able to offer replacement housing and relocation assistance. Um, this award is, um, you can receive up to $25,000 if you are eligible to receive this money, and the eligibility is dependent upon your level of income and the location of your buyout home in or outside of the floodplain. Uh, if you have specific questions about our replacement housing award, feel free to give me a call or grab me afterwards. I'd be happy to talk it over, but it's a, it's a little complicated, so feel free to grab me and we'll go through any questions you might have. Um, as you are aware, the, um, the flooding took, took place across the entire state of Iowa. And as a result, we have a large community, the city of Cedar Rapids, that map that Meredith showed earlier, uh, where a lot of the properties that were, were hit most heavily were in the downtown district and even on the outsides in the 500-year floodplain. And through this program, the 100-year floodplain properties are all deed restricted to, to green space in perpetuity. But looking forward to redevelopment, we realized there was a need for um, some disposition to happen for these properties in the buyout program. Uh, these disposition scenarios are limited to properties in the 500-year floodplain only. And we'll go over a few and some of their different implications for the CDBG federal identity that comes with using federal funds. Um, we allow properties to be disposed of at fair market value and by competitive process. This is a mandatory requirement we put in place uh, for administrators to, um, to, to get rid of their properties and, and, and offer redevelopment um, scenarios for developers and, and others alike. To establish the fair market value of the property, there, um, that can happen in one of two ways. The city can offer um, a private appraiser, a certified appraiser, to come in and appraise that, that property as well as um, they can take the property to a public auction and people can bid on the property. For If the city decides to do an appraisal, they must uh, publicly advertise the sale of the home and they must accept the highest offer, which can be no less than the appraised amount. If they decide to go the public auction route, they can offer the home at public auction and the highest bidder determines the fair market value. We have seen that in some communities where all buyouts were in the 500-year floodplain, um, they uh, they went the public auction route. It was an easier way to do it, and they didn't have that expense of the appraisal cost. If you go through this process, the CDBG identity is then removed, and um, the sale proceeds that the city or county were to receive must be returned to the state as program income. A few other disposition scenarios that we've discussed with our partners around the state um, we do offer a single-family new construction program, and we've offered these lots, the cleared lots, to be entered into this program. What the program does is it offers um, down payment assistance to a homeowner of 25 to 35% of the cost to build the home, and it gives a lot to the developer to build the house. Um, another way we can do this is that the cities and counties can donate the properties to a local nonprofit organization that is purposed in its charter to offer low to moderate income housing. They can take the property, if it's, it's possible it could be still standing, demolition is not required, although encouraged. Um, they could rehab that property with other funding, uh, other funding sources and then supply the housing to low to moderate income households. Again, it's required for this that the um, national objective for low to moderate income housing be met and all documentation is required to support that. In this example, the CDBG identity is retained, and the sale proceeds or um, 
if you donate it. Nothing is required to come back to the state as program income. Uh, we have had quite a few challenges over the past three and a half years with the buyout programs in Iowa. And I think especially with housing programs, it's a very emotional process. Um, you'll talk to the people in the community that have lived in these homes for um, possibly even a few generations. And I think that's something that new grantees and existing should um, be cognizant of, that you are, um, you know, their homes were already severely damaged and they've been through this turmoil and this um, situation with a disaster, but now you're purchasing their home and potentially demolishing it and nothing will be there. So I think it's good to uh, to be reminded that it is very emotional for people. And as Amanda said earlier, this the, the intent of this program is to not make people whole, and that's something that is hard to understand, especially when talking about um, their, their 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 home. The city of Des Moines, uh, in particular, has been a challenge for us. They um, just give you an idea of their contract. They have a relatively small contract for our allocation, seven point one million dollars. However, this uh, contract does include 127 mobile home units and uh, that, that span across two different parks. Um, this area in Des Moines has always been an eyesore for the city. It's, um, it's located right on the river that goes through Des Moines, and it was, has actually been flooded in um, numerous different times, and most recently in 2008 and then again in 2010. Uh, with these uh, these mobile homes, as we heard yesterday in the Uniform Relocation um, Act um, time slot, was about the the URA and how complicated it is to to offer URA assistance to these folks that are involuntary displaced. And how this involuntary displacement occurred was that the landowners of the parks decided to take the buyout, and those who owned their mobile home units on this land were then involuntarily displaced and were considered tenants under the URA. Uh, the city of Des Moines, when they went into this, they knew that they had the expertise on hand. They are an entitlement community. They've done URO many times with different DOT projects and other things, but they really underestimated the time that was required to go into this program. They told me numerous times they wish they would have um, hired a private administrator just to do the URA portion for them because it was so complex. And as you know, again, going back to DOBs, um, the the challenge with the uh, the mobile homes is that in the state of Iowa, the mobile homes are considered uh, personal property, not real property. So first determining how we were to uh, how to assess these homes was challenging. We ended up using the 2008 MADA value, and um, that was helpful in determining the value of the homes. But in calculating an, an award, uh, we looked at the DOBs of the 2010 FEMA money these folks received. And we'll go ahead through. This is an actual example of someone in in Des Moines, again, just to recap, so they, uh, this person owned their mobile home and they rented the site that their, their mobile home sat on. They were eligible for an acquisition award and for a URA tenant relocation assistance. Their acquisition award, um, as you can see, they, their, their dwelling was actually assessed at $3,500 at the time of the flood. These were very old mobile homes from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, they were eligible for a land award because they didn't own the land. Uh, and oftentimes, the FEMA repair from the 2010 disaster far outweighed the, um, the, the fair market value of their dwelling. And in this instance, they received $20,000. And the fair market, dwelling, fair market value of their dwelling was only $3,500. So we were left in a situation where, for many of these mobile homeowners, they had already received the max amount of funding we could give them. And this is an extremely hard thing to... Um, to discuss with people and say, here's what it's worth, here's what you've already been given, yet we are asking you to leave. Um, what the city decided to do was they used their own funding and they were able to offer each homeowner $500 to hand over title to their mobile home so that they could demolish the park and, uh, and pay the landowner their, their acquisition award. Um, that was a, a struggle for them because they did have to use their own city funds for this, uh, but they realized that there was no other way to clear this area. And they, uh, they really had to adapt in that situation and, and make the best of it. Some improvements for our program. Um, looking back, our last buyout that we had administered in, 1990, or in Iowa was back in 1993. And if you transfer it back in time a little bit, our documentation and guidance was not kept electronically on a computer. 
Uh, when we first started the buyout, we had a few boxes that were in one of our storage closets, and that was our, our buyout guidance. So we really had to start over with looking into the documentation that would be required and, and coming up with guidelines for the programs because it wasn't easily accessible. We would have required the use of councils of government and third-party administrators looking back. We feel that a lot of the smaller communities really lack the expertise and knowledge of CDBG regulations, and, um, and we would have liked to require that use for, for this program. Going forward, I would really advise um, existing and new grantees to use other states as examples. We've created a lot of um, a lot of documents that are online, or you can go ahead and contact us, or I'm assuming other states as well, for, um, for help with these programs. It's not an easy process, and I would really rely on others that have been through it to, to help you. Also, uh, we definitely wouldn't be where we are today without the assistance of our HUD Disaster Office staff. They've been great in helping us, and they're very responsive, and we really appreciate all that they have, have helped us with throughout this program. Um, for a few accomplishments for our for the state of Iowa for the buyouts. As of January of 2012, for the CDBG buyout program, the 100% funded, um, 1,427 properties have been acquired, and about half of those have been demolished. For the FEMA match buyout, 950 have been acquired, and 801 have been demolished. So really, as we're, we're going out and monitoring these communities, we're really seeing a difference that this program is making in this, um, this green space that is coming out of this program. Another thing to point out is the, um, I wanted to show a graph of the funds expended since March of 2010. We've spent 91 million out of our 230 million allocation. This is just for the 100% CDBG program. And as you can see, it's uh, sort of all over the place for when um, funds were expended and how quickly your subrecipients draw funding. I would recommend that everyone um, Talk to your subrecipients and, and make sure that there's a system they have in place working out for drawing the funds regularly. This is something that we really push for um, administrators to draw funds all the time. But it's good to talk to them and hear what's going on on their end of things or if they're having any roadblocks that you can offer them assistance with. Again, my name is Katie Giesler with the uh, Iowa Economic Development Authority. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me afterwards, send me an email or grab me, uh, whichever works best for you. If we have any questions, we can open it up. Good morning. My name is Angie Hubbard, and I'm with the Metropolitan Development and Housing Agency in Nashville, Tennessee. We're here to talk about our disaster recovery program, particularly our single-family homeowner grant and loan program. But we're going to come from a different perspective than you've heard the past few days. We actually received a direct allocation from HUD through the 2010 Supplemental Appropriations Act. We're one of the first cities in recent years, it's my understanding, that has received a direct allocation. We have um, a different experience, a different perspective, and I understand there are some cities that will receive some direct allocation through the 2011, so we're going to hopefully address this to help you through this process. A little perspective on or background on where we were. Not sure what the uh, national coverage was, but in May, um, for, on May 1st and 2nd in uh, 2010, we had over 17 inches of rain in the Middle Tennessee area. This is the highest amount in 140 years. The Cumberland River is runs through the heart of Davidson County, and it um, it exceeded its banks as well as all the other tributaries, but it flooded some of our major tourist areas. And that resulted in the federal de um, disaster declaration on May 4th. A little background on Nashville-Davidson County. We are a metropolitan form of government. So in addition to receiving the direct allocation, we also only have to deal with one council, and our jurisdiction is countywide. Some, so the property damage is throughout the entire county. As you can see, quite a bit of residential properties are outside of the 100-year floodplain. That means they don't have flood insurance. That's a map of Davidson County, and the dots are the impact of properties. And as you can see, this flood was impacted every area, and low income, non low income, everyone was affected. 
There's some statistics on the economic impact. Lower Broadway, home of our world famous honky tonks, some of those were flooded. The Grand Ole Opry House was flooded. The Opryland Hotel was flooded. Opry Mills, which is a major outlet mall similar to Great Vine Mills in Texas, was flooded. All of those have returned, but Opry Mills will open at the end of March. That's the damage to our infrastructure throughout the county. We have two water treatment plants. One of them was shut down for a month. And this is our response. Immediately when the rain started falling, our mayor was out with a public information campaign. And our council took some, and our metropolitan government agencies took some immediate actions, one being a streamlined administrative process, which was to help homeowners get through the permitting process, which will really help our single family um, program when we get that up and running. We're trying to think ahead of what kind of regulatory barriers we can ease to help homeowners stay or get back into their house. We had a, just a brochure created just for flood damaged properties and an online permitting process. Our council passed an ordinance to require our Metro Water Services to update their stormwater management manual to incorporate some incentives and best practices for low income development to help try to prevent damage and encourage development outside of vulnerable areas in the future. And our mayor, by the two weeks with, after the flood, created a recovery team which included representatives and experts in housing, economic development, city officials, and this comes into um, play when we are deciding our needs assessment. And we approach disaster recovery in its totality with looking at all of our needs and all of the resources, hoping we would get some CDBG disaster recovery dollars. But what we tried to look at was put it all in the pot and see what could help pay for what recovery. The impact, economic impact, the tourist areas, heavily insured. So we did not include economic development in our disaster recovery plan for CDBG because the impact was insured and we couldn't duplicate those benefits. So we focused on the housing piece. So that came out of our recovery team. And of course, the individual assistance is typical throughout a disaster area with FEMA and SBA coming in first. We, um, we have a nonprofit called the Community Foundation, and it does significant fundraising. Garth Brooks put on four or six concerts in Nashville to raise money for the Community Foundation. Then they give awards to nonprofits. It's not direct assistance. So we were able to help our nonprofits get resources to go out and help with food, clothing, and as well as to help um, supply a source of funds for non-eligible CDBG housing needs. We, on May 22nd, we held a series of rebuild clinics throughout Davidson County. And at each rebuild clinic was a housing professional, someone representing the um, lending industry, a bank, attorneys, someone from our codes department, to, and they were held at churches. And we, this was really a great outreach effort, especially for our elderly that was primarily who came in to see us. And that's where we really could sit down one-on-one -on -one and find out exactly what needs are out there and what gaps we needed to fill if we got the disaster recovery money. From that, we created a We Are Home program. It was our first disaster recovery program, and it is our single-family homeowner rehab grant and loan program. And from there, I'm going to turn it over to my director, Joe Kane, to give you all the background on that. Thank you. My name is Joe Kane with MDHA as well. I want to talk a little bit about how we were able to move um, almost immediately with, with some disaster funds getting out to the public who needed it the most. Uh, when the flood took place, 
um, in May of 2010, we were only 30 days into our, our consolidated plan, our five-year consolidated plan with CDBG funds. Um, we managed to work immediately to amend that consolidated plan and divert all of the non-committed funds. Very few funds have been committed, and we were able to commit just about $3 million of CDBG and home funds directly over to a disaster recovery. Um, those funds then were utilized to fund this We Are Home program, for, which is a loan program to assist the uh, impacted buyers. One thing that also assisted us is this had all taken place after the stimulus funding had come through. We had worked with our Metropolitan Council, who normally it would have taken a, a six to eight week process to do an amendment. When the stimulus funding was coming in, we had worked with council to get that be able to get done with a single reading in council and so it could get done in as quickly as, as two weeks instead of taking a longer process to amend the existing consolidated plan. So with the, with the, those funds diverted, we immediately started, started working with the funding of the We Are Home program. The, um, the initial phase of that is for homeowner, owner occupied homes only that were impacted. Um, the, the CDFI, the, the Nashville Housing Fund, is a CDFI. We've worked with them over many, many years as a subrecipient. They had administered down payment assistance programs for us, and they were um, quite um, skilled at, at being able to do underwriting. They mortgage, um, they, they provide first mortgages to low income home buyers and all the way up to 120% of median income. And their expertise in that w allowed us to go ahead and partner up with them as a subrecipient and get the program started. The, the plan, the plan that was in place, we, we started looking then at what's going to happen with the disaster recovery coming coming forward because at this time when this started we had not quite yet gotten the final approval of how many dollars are going to be coming to Nashville. Is it going to be coming directly to us? Is it going to be coming through the state? But we knew that they were going to be coming and so we, we based on that we were using our best best estimates as to how one program would be able to roll into with the disaster funds coming along. Once we received notice of the, of the direct appropriation that would be coming to Nashville, we went and got, we got a, a line of credit from the Metropolitan Government. MDHA is a PHA. We're independent from Metropolitan Government. And so we actually had to go and essentially borrow a, a line, of, line of credit from the government to continue funding this project, knowing that the disaster funds would be coming to us within the, within the weeks and months ahead. And so we, with that, um, it, we continued the funding and we got the final notice of the allocation not until November. By that time, we had probably already had some six, seven hundred homes into the pipeline that we had gotten out. We had managed to get inspected as to what work needed to be done. The program, we, with, the, with the program, we went out and looked at the homes and the condition that they were in at the time they made application towards, uh, towards the area and did cost estimation on what those repairs were going to be to bring the house back up to, to standards with it. That, that detail was also quite fortunate because we, through our com normal community development block grant funds and home program, we run a rehab program in-house. And so we had in-house staff to be able to assist with us on those cost estimations for the repairs. And we're, like I said, we were able to continue to move forward with that funding as it came on through. The initial funding amount is $10,731,000. Of that, we moved $9.9 .9 million to the We Are Home program to con con continue that funding. Uh, a portion of that money was, was used to repay the line of credit that we had gotten from the Metropolitan Government as we continue the program. And we moved forward. We had to make amendments to get a new new agreement with our subrecipient based on the changes of the, of the actual dollars that have now come into play and how that would work. And to date we have over, over 800 programs that were done, um, 800 homes that were finished with that. The balance of the first allocation went to creating the, the long-term recovery plan for the city of Nashville that we continue to, um, that we continue to implement, which is taking us to our next phase of the, of the funding that came towards us. And I'm going to turn that back over to Angie, let her talk about that second phase of funding that came to us. And just a little bit um, to describe the structure of the single-family homeowner program was the 
it's a tiered approach with persons who are not don't meet the underwriting criteria may be eligible for a grant up to ten thousand dollars and then if there's still a need for a gap a do on sale um, loan for persons who um, chose not to go to FEMA or SBA or turn something away if they stepped into this program they did not get a better deal than um, they would have gotten at SBA, which would have been a 4% loan with terms of four, I mean, 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, depending on um, what the underwriting and what, they, um, what loan terms they um, had agreed to. So that's how our loan and grant program was structured. And MDHA kept in house the inspections, the environmental reviews, and any um, work associated with lead-based paint. So at the time that we rolled this out, we were still pretty new from the flood and not a whole lot of work had been done, and although some homes had been already gutted. But moving forward, we received notice of the second allocation in the spring of 2011 with an additional $22 million for Nashville's Davidson County. And from that, we're establishing new housing activities based on the um, need that's been identified through, the, through our subrecipients. Um, some instances where the son owns the house and mom lives there, but he didn't live in the house. So there were some gaps that we needed to fill that couldn't be addressed through our original program. So that's what we're doing with the second round. And then we, ha we added some infrastructure and long-term recovery efforts. And we're, we're just now setting those up. But this is, and this is really, um, I included our timeline, especially for the new grantees, because as I think the gentleman from Arkansas said, CDBG is not intended for disaster recovery. This is not a fast track to get out into the uh, neighborhoods in the community need to do work. There is a considerable amount of time involved and that needs to be communicated to the public so they have an understanding of what it takes and once that action plan is even approved, there's still the DRGR setups and all that fun stuff that you'll get to experience. What really worked for us was being an entitlement community and receiving the direct allocation. And that, and being able to address everything at a local level, that is, that is the number one thing. Then being able to reprogram our CDBG and home entitlement funds, that helped us get started so quickly and then just roll over into the disaster recovery program. We had strong leadership at every level and having a strong subrecipient and especially a CDFI if you're doing a loan and grant program and you don't have the in-house um, expertise to do underwriting, highly recommend that. What we did with our, our CDFI though after the initial allocation was up and running, they had already administered the reprogram funds, they were administering the first allocation, we sent in internal auditors to make sure that they were um, meeting the intent of the and the letter of the notices with duplication of benefits, eligibility determination before we move forward with the new housing programs. I highly recommend a regular audit of any subrecipient that you will utilize with your disaster recovery funds. Our field office had no experience with this, but they were absolutely wonderful to work with, um, as well as the HUD disaster recovery staff. Um, we did not hesitate to pick up the phone and call, and if they couldn't answer, they made sure that they got the right person from the disaster recovery staff, and we are so grateful. The waivers. Take advantage of the waivers that are in your notices and any of the other waivers that are in the CDBG regs. And review of other resources, you will find that there's, right now, the only resources out there are for the states. And while the basic CDBG rules don't change, how things evolved and are administered is a little different. We hope to have on our website resources to help and we'll provide our contact information that you can call us. Um, I always like to back into things by looking at audit reports. So we did pull up some of the OIG reports. and. Good rule of thumb is 
if you're not sure if you can do it, think of it from a monitor perspective. And if you can't explain it, document it, or defend it, it's not a good idea. <laughs> and looking at prior notices, if you know that your congressional delegation is um, working to get funds allocated to your city, go ahead and look at some other notices. Even before they're up on the Federal Register, yours is up. That way you get an idea of what HUD has required in the past and you can start thinking about your action plan from those um, regulation standpoint because there are some unique rules with disaster recovery that make it a little different than your um, regular CDBG program. One of the challenges we faced was the timing of formal training and technical assistance, but we, we this isn't, um, it, it's just a timing issue. These things happen so quickly and you've got to mobilize quickly and get out in the community quickly, but have it, planning a training session and technical assistance workshops, that takes a lot of planning. So it, it is a, a lesson in some patience. Um, DRGR is a challenge. Um, we have, we administer NSP as well, are fortunate to be able to pick their brains on BRGR, but um, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. And educating the public is a huge challenge, again on the time frame, on what is covered. Any rehab, it, you are going to get the age old question, can we upgrade, can we add this in when we rehab, and so you need to make sure your policies are set up on the front end and they are clear and you've communicated that because those will be the questions that you get.